Welcome, welcome everyone. I see Karen already knows the drill. Please drop in your location in the chat. Introduce <laughs> yourself in the chat. We'd love to know where you guys are tuning in from. Um, I'm Polly. I'm in Oklahoma right now. Welcome, Simi. Welcome, Shanita and ATL. London in the house. Welcome, Toronto in the house. Italy, Switzerland, Boston, Texas, Mumbai, Panama, LA. Oh my goodness. Welcome, 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 everyone. Um, we're so excited for class three. You all right? Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it already three? Oh my goodness. It is, yeah. I don't even know where time has flown. These are going by so quickly. Welcome, St. Louis. Nice to see you all coming in. If this is your first class, let us know. If you've been to all of the classes so far, also let us know. First class, oh my goodness, you have some homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> you have to watch this series, the others. Good thing the other two classes are recorded so you can catch up if this is your first class. Three out of three for Dominique, welcome. Two out of three, third class from Germany. Welcome everyone, welcome. Um, we will get started in a second. Three out of three. Yes, we love that. Don't worry, the other classes are recorded so you can catch up. You all have some homework before the fourth class. Welcome, welcome. Um, the recorded sessions can be found on both organizations' websites and we'll drop the chat in uh, the link in the chat. So just a second. <laughs> I should host everything everywhere all the time. It's true. <laughs> it's so true. Time. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> And welcome everyone. We'll get started in a second. Yeah, we're just holding off a minute to as people filter in. Um, but love seeing all the energy. Um, maybe we should go ahead and start. Um, You can register for everything there. Polly just dropped the link in the chat. And, um, and the last two classes are, the videos are up on that website as well. So you can catch Kiana Hayari talking about uh, how she works on assignment and a bunch of great tips there. And Andrea Wise last week uh, is a photo editor for, for ProPublica. So talked about this stuff from the photo editor perspective. Um, so yeah, we are at the halfway point. I am Peter DeCampo. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Everyday Projects. Um, and one exciting thing, you can keep dropping your locations in the chat. We love to see it. But the other exciting thing is that we've got two more classes and then we're starting to think about what does the second semester look like? What does season two of the essentials look like? So what we wanna know today is what do you guys wanna learn that we haven't covered yet that's not in future classes, the next two classes coming up, we would love to hear, you know, what are your ideas? What are your thoughts? What are your needs for what you need to learn in this industry? Um, so that when we think about doing more of these classes a few months from now, uh, what can we include? So, uh, yeah, let's see. This is where you can follow us. And yeah, totally, uh, I love that people in the chat are reminding everyone else. Um, these are free classes. Uh, we wanted to make these available for everyone, but it is super helpful if everyone gives a $5 donation to Black Women Photographers um, for all the great work that they are doing. Um, and here's the info on how you can do that. Um, five, $5 each doesn't really seem like a lot on an individual level, but there are a lot of you in this room. There's like a hundred people attending this right now. So that would go a long way if everyone did it. So thanks for considering that if you can. Um, the Everyday Projects grant is still open. We are giving out two grants uh, to work on a project for $6,000 each. The grants come with mentorship from <clears throat> Mallory Benedict of National Geographic and Jahan Jelani of The Guardian. Um, the deadline is June 7th. So you can find that on our site as well. So please check that out. Oh, Polly's dropping the link, thank you. Um, the Essentials is made possible through a community grant from the Lenfest Institute and the Facebook Journalism Project. So big thanks to them. 
And uh, also a big thanks to the regular supporters of the Everyday Projects who make all of our work possible, um, Photo Wings, uh, Open Society Foundation, Culture and Art, and Code for Africa. So big thanks to them as well. And now I'm going to introduce your teacher today. So Nikki Kwamina Wu is a Black and Native Hawaiian photographer who divides her time between the African continent, Southeast Asia, and New York City, although she's not in any of those places right now. <laughs> her fascination with the tenacity of the human spirit deeply influences her approach to image making, working on documentary imagery that explores human rights issues, health, culture, and breaking news. Initially a commercial photographer, she became an art director and producer with brands such as Ralph Lauren, Ann Taylor, and Target before getting back behind the lens when she shifted to journalism. Nikki is also a university professor at Parsons School of Design in New York, where she teaches lighting when she's not reporting internationally. She's a winner of American Photography 37, a recipient of the Nikon Maryland Stafford Photo Reportage Grant in 2020, and an awardee of the Reuters Storytelling Grant in 2018. Her clients include CNN, The Washington Post, Human Rights Watch, BuzzFeed, Apple, Reporters Beyond Borders, Reuters, The Guardian, and Vogue Italia magazine. So we are really thrilled to have her and take it away, Nikki, let me spotlight you. Hi. Thanks so much for that intro. Um, so yeah, everything you said. So I'm just gonna start by showing everyone just a quick overview of my work. That screen share is okay. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? No, not yet. Not yet, okay. Great. There we go. There we go. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to show you a quick overview of some of my stuff, um, which, as Peter just said, I started out um, as a portrait person and um, studio lighter, right? Um, assisting that kind of thing, and so it was so rare for me to just shoot daylight. And if I did, you know, you bring a big light with you um, versus just relying on the sun. So actually it became a little bit difficult um, when I shifted into, into documentary. Um, I moved to the continent and was just photographing things that I thought were kind of pretty. Um, and then slowly started to lean into documentary, like the difference between what's a pretty image, but how do you help people feel what's happening in each place and moment, like for whatever story you're trying to tell, which actually was, you know, for me anyway, has been quite difficult to do. Um, it's in Sri Lanka, bombing, the bombing there. It's in Senegal, I'm going fairly quickly so that we have time to do the rest of can, can you give them a little about. bit more space? We got people, we got people <laughs> yeah. asking to slow down. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's beautiful work. Know. We want to see it. Yeah, we'll just like power through. Um, let's go back to commercial. Uh, yeah, so I was, so I was doing this kind of this kind of work, right? It's like kind of pretty. There's some light. It's a pretty person, which is really it's much simpler work because they're professionals, everyone knows how to pose, you know where you're gonna shoot the locations beforehand, you understand how to light them, you have an entire team with you talking to them and doing hair and, you know, and, and making sure every facet is right. Um, and as I shifted away from that work, initially I was doing work that it feels a little bit more fine arty um, because it's just pretty, there's no context, there's no, you know, they were just things. I was walking around with the camera. Um, I moved to Tanzania for four years. Um, and as I was learning to fall in love with the country and the where I, you know each each place that I was living, things that I found really incredible, um, having grown up in the States. And so I started slowly looking for things that were much more depthful. I had, you know, 
Uh, this is a story about the intersection of um, modern health care and traditional medicine in a 98% um, Muslim archipelago and how those two things intersect. My very first breaking news story. So I was just talking to Peter um, and Polly about like, I didn't know how to do captions. We don't do captions in commercial work. Um, I didn't know how to craft a story so that you bring the viewer into the story. And it's not just this, you know, quick parachute photo of someone in pain, but to, to sort of learn how to pick up nuance. That was all things that I've had to spend a lot of time on actually. So in Senegal, uh, coastal erosion there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So that's that's my work. Um, I'm gonna close that window. Um, and so I wanted to talk today about um, portraits, how to do portrait lighting. Um, and usually very often, and I think, and this is geared like to, to photographers who are coming um, from places where they generally just rely on natural light versus, you know, if you're from the US, you're just, you can bring lights with you, you're popping in your car, it's not a big deal. Um, and this is Richard Misrock, it's an image where, you know, it doesn't, everything doesn't have to be perfectly cleanly lit across, across the um, foreground. It needs to partly build tension or it can build tension, right? So even though in this image, this is from like 78 or something, um, Flint here, I can still see his eyes. Like you don't want people's eyes to completely fall away. This is Hannah Yoon. Um, and you start to care about this man based on it's the, sun, the setting sun. Um, his eyes are lit. You can still see that there are catch lights in his eyes, which is actually really important. People's eyes just look dead if they don't have catch lights. It's just a portrait. I still do get a catch light. His eyes are lit. They're not like in dark shadow. This um, a former student of mine, Khan, whose work is lovely. And it's about like, you look at his eyes, but traditionally this isn't like perfect lighting, right? Because half of this face in shadow but I still think it's a really successful portrait. Mary Hold, beautiful, right? quiet. And she's holding detail in the shadows, which is what you're, you need to look for. There's also another Mary Hold photo. So there's probably natural light coming in from the left, um, but she's putting a reflector in on the left side of the face because we wanna see the detail in both eyes. I can see those catch lights. And in a shadow detail, you still want to see some, you wanna see some detail. You don't want it just to go completely. I mean, you can sometimes like, this is not a 100% across the board thing, but generally you'd like to be able to keep some detail in, in the blacks, in your shadows, which he does beautifully here. This is a much more um, cleanly lit photograph and there's still this detail across the nose and shadow but you know it's a fine I can still see both eyes there's tension because there's still shadow on one side of the face along this body this is Kennedy Carter's work um work is lovely this is actually a portrait of her and so this is actually I I guess just straight sunlight from, from above, right? So light um, falls in a straight line. So if the sun is high on the right, I'm far right, um, you can see the shadow would be right behind her. But again, we can see detail in her eyes. Everything is nice and clean. Another Mary Hall photo of um, Miami Beach, like people who live in Miami Beach. Which I think is just incredible. The pop of color, all of those things, but a lot of it is dictated by how how the light is hitting this woman. There's a fall off on either side, or like all the way around her face. 
I have catch lights. I really engage with her eyes. I'm engaging with the color, all of the necessary elements to, to get people to, to really fall into an image. And here's one, and, I, and I, this is Gregory Prescott. I included this image to <laughs> disprove my, base, my earlier point, right? Um, where even though I can barely see the eyes on this gentleman, and these are much more um, commercial images, of course, like in documentaries might be harder. I'm not, it depends on the situation. You have to use your best judgment. Like everything is a choice is, is mostly my point. So this gentleman has such incredible cheekbones. His hair is this color, his eyebrows are this color. It doesn't necessarily matter that we see his eyes, even though you know the photographer could have chosen to hold it if they wanted. It's still the light is still coming from above overhead because you can see the shadow around the neck. These are all things that editors are looking at when they're looking at your images. Um, probably not as technically, but they know they can tell if you know what you're doing based on how you're lighting your subjects. Or you know daylight. This is another Mary Hall, and I included this one because there's a shadow dissecting his face across the nose, but because the window is, you can see him very clearly, um, the light on his face on the right-hand side still has some detail, it still has shadow, there's light on his back, like it's still, I still am interested in it, right? So it doesn't always have to be perfect, 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 but there needs to be a reason why it's not. Right. So she could have brought in a light on the left-hand side to fill in that shadow. And there is, you know, there's detail there. Maybe she didn't. Maybe it's natural. It's just kind of cool. And I'm going to close with this Micah Carter image um, because it sort of goes into what we're going to talk about. Um, this is called Open Shadow. There, she's clearly under a tree. Um, it's probably a little, it's later in the day, all of which you can tell by the shadows. Um, and it's softer, but even though her black hair is very dark, her skin is dark, so near her ears, it kind of falls off. I can still see the barest hint of detail there though, right? Her face is beautifully lit in the center. It could have been a reflector. It could have been a, an actual light too, like a strobe, but a flash, a fla um, you can use flash. It kind of depends on the modifiers that you're using. Um, if you're just using like a straight, let's say you shoot Canon or Sony, just those little, you know, on camera flashes, which is actually what I use. Um, so I use the, the Profoto version of it, but it's the same thing. You just want to put something on the cover of the flash. So it's not like really harsh, really ugly light. You want like a piece of diffusion and whatever that is. Like if that is a plastic bag, it's okay. I mean, you know, you don't want to use the plastic bag too, too, too often, just like, you know, multiple firing shots because you're, it's getting hot, right? Um, but any piece of something that is kind of translucent and see-through is going to change the quality of light onto your subject, which is what we're, we're looking for. Um, so these are all good portraits, like portraits that I think are beautiful, that illustrate a bunch of things. And I'm gonna show you some bad portraits, which are all mine, just to you know, make sure everyone's okay. Um, and they're, you know, they're portraits when I was first starting out with natural light all the time. And this one's okay. Um, it's for an NGO, but this little girl's hijab is pulled just far forward enough that even though I, I can light the, you know, the left side of her face is, it's like, you know, it's a nice open shadow. It's okay. But I've got this line across her, her cheek on, on the right hand side because that's where her job is. And so after, after I show you some photos, we're gonna get into like a really quick, really short, I made a video. Um, lighting tutorial, yeah. There's a photo from Ethiopia. And I think that this is the problem or was for me at least the difficulty in shifting to um, documentary work versus commercial. Because commercially, I know that I want this in the background. Um, this is a, a like a garbage um, recycling plant, essentially, in Ethiopia, um, like a garbage dump site, rather, sorry. And because I was so clear about what I wanted the backdrop to be, and the sun just happened to be behind her. So like, what, what do I do? And I couldn't shoot it 
later in the day because these, um, they're like the pickers are only out in the earlier parts of the day. Like they're not usually there in the evening or in the, you know, like four o'clock, five o'clock when the light would have been much more beautiful. And so in commercial photography, I would have had like some big old lights, like lighting her face, bringing the backdrop down and separating that. But obviously as all of you know, in documentary, you're just like, this is what I have, great, cool. Um, and her face is, is quite dark and <laughs> the sky is blown out because <laughs> I was just starting. I was like, oh, what do I do? You know, I just, and obviously you can bring some things back um, digitally. It's, it's becomes difficult again for, or not again, but like for world press, for all of these different contests, a lot of times you can't retouch. You're allowed to bring in the highlights and you can bring up shadows, but like you wanna make sure you have the, the latitude on, on your film to do that. This photo, same, like I wanted to have the sea behind her. Um, it was for a swimwear line. Um, and yeah, the sun was directly overhead, which is why she has these raccoon eyes here. I can use my mouse, sorry. She has these dark, deep set raccoon eyes. The sun is coming right here. Her nose is very bright, terrible. And if, it, if this, Certainly this was a little bit more commercial. So like I can fill that in later, but if this is a documentary um, for documentary work, I can't retouch this hard line right here, um, which becomes problematic, right? Um, and same for this guy, there were cars on the other side. Um, and I wanted to show the salt mining behind him in Ethiopia, but that's what direct overhead light looks like in eyebrows. So there's that. And okay, so that is the end of the bad portrait. And then we'll start to get into um, what to do. And I made a video again, like for all of you that are um, very clear on lighting, this is, it's only four minutes, I'll just power through. And then we'll, we'll actually get into um, a couple of people's portfolios and, and how to hone that work. I'm just gonna um, talk over these, feel free to ask questions. So light travels in a straight line. At 12 noon, the sun, your light source is directly overhead. So you get really harsh shadows around the eyes and across the nose, like we just talked about. This is like 12.45 or one o'clock. My friend Eric, you can see one side of his face is in shadow. The eyebrows sort of act like a shelf. Um, and so, everything below that starts to go in shadow, which is why your nose though, because your nose is jutting out, your nose is still getting that light. So you can see that, <laughs> my video director. Let me just put my finger in the phone. Um, on this side though, he's got some highlights, he's got mid-tones. The shadows aren't too dark, which at least is, you know, because it's, it's daylight. So the first thing you can start to do is turn, if, if it's possible, turn your model around or turn your subject a little bit. Obviously this is just in portrait. Um, and you can see how the shadow got shorter. So now he's got some detail right here. That's still the same. The shadow is shorter. Great. Kept turning him. You can't really go that far, right? Because I'm just turning him 360 and the, the sun is still directly overhead. If they tilt his face up, it helps the sun fill in a little bit. If, you're, you know, if he went down and you know, that kind of thing. Um, this is a portrait of that light, not great. So use a bounce to fill in the shadows. You can get a bounce for like 15 US dollar, 20. And this is a four in one, it's about 24 inches. You get silver, white, uh, gold, black, and a diffuser. It's me filling in that shadow with uh, silver, which is a little harsh. And it's great because it fills in the shadow detail, but it doesn't really help with this bright light on his nose, right? Super bright light. I'm only doing one side. This side is still in shadow, like still not a great image. Um, diffusion is the action of spreading light from source, the sun evenly um, to reduce the glare and harsh shadows. Diffused light is when direct light is scattered naturally like by clouds. So you want to take photos if it's a nice cloud cover. And so inside of the bounce is, the base is a diffusion. And if you put it between the light source and the subject, in this case, over his head, it's great if you have assistant. 
then all of a sudden it's a nice filled scattered light across his face he's helping me there right and clearly that's a better portrait um, another way to diffuse light is to place a subject in an open shade, like under an awning or an overhang or in under a tree in this case. So we just backed him up, same everything. An open shadow means you can still see details. So here you can see the pine leaves or grass or whatever that is, both in this open shadow and then in highlight, in sunlight. And so if you do that, you're your image is really gonna come out a bit better, right? It's much more even. And he's still got a little bit of a highlight on the left-hand side. And here I did the same thing, but under an awning. So he's still getting sunlight from the left side, but I backed him up, you know, a foot and it's much more even. And at, that, at which point you want, if you can bring in a bounce, that really works because now you can add a catch light, your friend helping out. Um, yeah, she right here, she was just learning about the bounce um, where you get, you kick up a little bit of highlight on the skin, his eyes have a nice catch light, it's that kind of thing, which is what you're, you're looking for. And just, you know, ask people to help. Hey, can you be my friend? Can you do mind holding this? Sorry, babe. Usually kind of just like, and that part is a better shadow, right? Like that's a nicer image. And that's that open shadow with a bounce. Okay, that is the end of that. Um, so let's talk about some portfolio reviews. Um, so this is Danielle Villasano's work who is teaching the class next week on uh, grant writing, which is great. Let's see if I have any. Um, and the first thing I notice about Danielle's work is on her landing page. It's, it's a great image. And you need to think about your website. Think about the editors, like your editors are essentially your clients, right? And so editors, if editors see, I don't know, they've seen hundreds and hundreds of, of photo websites, right? How does your work stand out to them? And just like the way you dress, like for, for everyone, like you know that if you're going into a business meeting, you maybe not wear your pajamas. Like these are, it's all, it's the same general theory, I think. Um, you wanna put your best foot forward. You wanna just grab their attention. So your landing image needs to be one that's engaging, right? I'm gonna to switch to mine really quick. That's my landing image. Even though it that image isn't necessarily tied to a specific documentary story, it's it's one that'll get someone to an editor to consider consider digging into the rest of my website, which is really important, right? Like that's that's our that's the thing we're trying to get them to do. Go back to Danielle's. Um, additionally. Her site is really clear. She tells you where, where you can find this image. It's in her projects. She's got projects, editorial. Editorial in, in this world means like magazine, um, newspaper work, that kind of thing. NGO work, her about contact. People have different ideas about this, whether your about and contact need to be, they can be in one or if they should be separate, totally up to you. She's got specific tear sheets and news. So as an editor who's looked at hundreds and hundreds and thousands of, of sites, and I don't have the time to really, you know, trudge through sites that don't have, like, these are where my stories are. These are where my projects are. I'm an, I'm an NGO person, an international documentary or international, um, yeah, NGO, sorry, I get nervous on camera, excuse me. Um, person, how, how am I gonna find work that is in the exact vein that I need? Something else that's really great about Danielle's site is its thumbnails and people, editors often talk about wanting to see thumbnails because they have five minutes to see your site. They're not gonna keep digging and excavating to find, you know, oh, there's that one photo, maybe she'll be right. They want the information as quickly as possible and thumbnails help them get that. 
um, and these are a nice size thumbnail. So even though I don't know by the by the title what the story is about on light inside, I have no idea. That's a beautiful image. It's beautifully lit. It's quiet. I'm I'm intrigued. Home of peace, my parents' graveyard, right? So those photos are still they grab me. If I click on one of the stories, her first image. Beautiful, like right there, here is a description. So now I know what I'm looking at. I know context, I understand that it's about trans women in Central America migrating towards Mexico and the US, um, all of the things. You also wanna start to consider your layout, which is really important. Layouts should be, firstly, the first images, the first, first one, like, you know, this red image, should be something that grabs your viewer. It's an opening. It makes them lean in to, to really figure out like why you talk to, and these are really basic ways of saying this. I'm so sorry. Um, why you think that man or woman that you see at a party is especially interesting and you wanna talk to them. There's something about them that makes you gravitate towards them. And that's what that first image is. The second image, same. Right, so, and this first set of images, they need to tell you something about the storyline. She's going in and out, her pacing is really good. I'm focusing on this woman, but the image next to it is, is a wider shot. So you also wanna shift your perspectives. This is a great diptych. And it, this depends on how, like for some people's site, it's triptychs on the page, it's, it can be a diptych, two by side, two, you know, two images next to each other, whatever that is. You want to consider layout. This works beautifully because one, I'm seeing this woman, her skin is side the point. I have from a commercial background. So I'm like, her skin is flawless. Sorry, that's nothing to do with documentary. Um, but I'm interested in her. And the next image isn't a woman with the exact same size of her head in this looking in the same position, right? So now it flows from going from here to here. Great. This image references the, the lyrical nature of this movement, which I think is wonderful. Usually here you might choose one or the other. Here's a more intimate image of that, like clearly someone has been in the hospital and then and going home. And how she breaks those down. Okay. So let's see one more for projects. Great, so she immediately chooses an image that's about, that's a wider image, you understand place. She's still got the write up. Because there's so many people in this image that the image next to it is a um, portrait or you know a tighter shot. Great, makes so much sense. Same here, this, this bombed car references the tank. This image is incredible and having it next to humans, right? Like humanizes the cost of this bridge on the road that was damaged during an insurgency. Additionally, she has captions. So if you're an editor who's trying to figure out really quickly what's happening, she's giving you that detail really quickly. And let's just check out her NGO job. Same, an NGO, it's nice to have NGO stuff break, broken out because NGOs tend to look for images that are lighter and brighter um, because they're essentially trying to get their shareholders and people to donate money and you know to prove why their work is important. And so it, it needs to have generally like an element of hope to it, which might not work as well in the news sphere. And because it's NGO, she doesn't have to have the captions in. You should, but you know, it's, you don't have to. Rather, it's not quite as necessary because she has this write-up about the entire project support. Portraits, great. Who she's working for, this is Fair Trade International. This is for UN Development Program, right? I'm just gonna do her about page. She's got a photo of herself. 
if you can get a photo of yourself or just to humanize you to the editor. They want to know who you are, which is essentially what you're telling them in this write-up. Um, she's a documentary photographer based in Istanbul. What she covers, the buckets that she covers so that the editor can understand, oh, these are the things that she's really interested in. If she's really interested in gender and displacement, I have a, pro I have a project in Turkey and it's about that she might be the right person for the job. And then she lists her accolades, what she's been doing, what she's interested in. She's with Woman Photograph, she's with Noor, her first photo book, um, and then what she believes in as the power of photography. Incredible, all of the things. And now her achievements, right? Like I now know as an editor who has cash that she's someone that I can trust with a storyline because she's got, these are all her jobs, right? So that's pretty wonderful. Okay. Her contact, okay. <laughs> um, her contact information is also, or our contact information is also very, very important because how else are they gonna get in touch with you? Don't just have an email um, because if there's a story that's a breaking story and they need someone right now, what if you didn't check their email that day? You need to also have your phone number and what, or you know, she's international. So her WhatsApp, if it's, you know, a, an American or a European or whoever trying to get in talk about, contact with her, they know that they don't just call plus I know, they need to also check her WhatsApp, right? Like that's clearly there. She's got links to her Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, every way possible you can tell an editor how to get in contact with you is incredibly important. Um, generally editors say not to just have this kind of, um, box here like that they have to fill out that kind of thing but this is a subscription to her newsletter which is different um so i can still get in contact her without emailing her or texting her or calling her but oh if i also just want to get her newsletter sent to me i can fill this out so beautiful website okay um so we're gonna start to talk about um two people's websites and mostly we're just going to talk about we'll start with cynthia um, who has beautiful work. Mostly because we're in, in just in terms of honing it um, so that editors can understand who she is, the type of work she does, that kind of thing, right? Um, so the landing image has energy, it has spirit. Hey, hey Nikki, yeah. I'm gonna interject really quickly. So I am gonna, um, make Cynthia a panelist, um, and if you know, so you guys can uh, yeah chat a little bit as you go through this. Cool. So cool. so Cynthia, um, I've never done this before, so hopefully this works. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cynthia, let us know when you're when you're here. Hi everyone. Hi Nikki. Hi Cynthia. Thanks so much for letting us. This it's super vulnerable of you to just be out here like that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. but we'll, we'll work it out for sure. Um, so first I'm just gonna read your bio just out loud so everyone can sort of have context um, for your work. Um, I'm Cynthia, I'm an independent documentary photographer, sometimes a journalist and videographer currently based in Harare, Zimbabwe. The focus of my work since be I began photographing in 2012 has been social issues. She has the bucket, mostly in her native country, Zimbabwe. So now I know that she speaks the local language. I know that she speaks English. I know that this is her camera, like all of it. She's giving me information. Um, she's telling me where she went to school, University of Zimbabwe, that she went to the market photo workshop in South Africa. Great that she participated in the World Press Photo Foundation. All of the things that are great. And she's a contributor to Everyday Zimbabwe and where she's been published. Huge. Oh, she's already been at the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and Bloomberg and Guardian, various international NGOs. Fantastic. And she's got a photo of herself. Well done. Contact. Her, both her phone number and email are there. So wonderful. Um, still with this, which people tend to not like, but that you all, since you already ha also have your telephone number and email, it's okay. Um, and it should be something that's clickable. So I don't, the editor doesn't have to do a second step. Like she doesn't have to copy and paste this 
because she might want it later. It's something that sh it should like, if it's a hyperlink, that would be great. Um, and then we can just go back to home. Um, I, I think your, the work is really beautiful. I don't think that this image is your open because it is, and there's a, there's a difference and Kiana talked about this um, a couple of weeks ago between the images that you show for an international crowd or international editors versus for um, people in country, editors for in your own country. And so this image works for editors in country because very often they're looking for things that are pretty. Um, whereas international editors are, are looking for something that grabs them and tells them a ton of information that's intimate, that's, you know, all of those kinds of things on your first page, on your first image. And you have so many other beautiful images that I, this feels a little too sweet and nice. Um, okay. So you, you might lose someone on this, on the, on the land. Okay. Um, whereas, I'm going to go to a second story. So in under stories, um, it should be the best, whatever your best work should be the very first one. Because that's, you know, 60% of the time where the editor is going to go first. I'm going to choose this because I've looked at the work already. So I'm going to choose this one, a place called home. Um, because this is beautiful work. It's all of the things that we just talked about, right? Like I can, it drops into thumbnails initially. I can get a quick overview if I need to just power through. But I can also stop and read each one. It clearly shows how to get back to thumbnails. My next, this portrait is beautifully lit. You know, it's daylight coming in. I can see detail all the way back here. I can see that he, the way he connected um, the, I don't know what they're called, you know, to keep his glasses on his face is with string. Like those are all little tiny details that are wonderful. She's got captions right here. It's hard to photograph flat things. And this is, a, it's beautifully done. You waited for the right light. These leaves are here. So it's not super, you know, just a bland flat piece of white paper. It becomes really interesting. Maybe a little less. This image is incredible. Um, sometimes you're a little bit back, but like that you're consistently waiting for the light in each of those images is really important. Beautiful. Like it's an image that you can't, that you won't find anywhere else. Or this intimacy between these two men talking, this home, captions, like all of it's really great. I'm gonna go back to the first story, which I, it's a little, and because it's not people, it's slightly harder to engage. Um, but the storyline is so good that I'm like, wait, what are, what's happening? It's COVID-19 and the, sub sh the subsequent shutdown of countries at the beginning, right, of 2020. Oh, that's really interesting, right? Records and the objects of personal rituals. It's a great story idea. This might not be because cell phones are something that <clears throat> are so common everywhere. And one, it's a great way to like have to think about and consider how to show this, right? Um, what kept me going was Christian motivational sermons that she would find that downloaded on YouTube, that kind of thing. And to figure out a way to translate that so that it shows up in a photo, so there's a great way to do that. And it's lit beautifully. You have lovely sense of that. Um, I don't know if it would be the first image because I have to read the caption to care about the photo. So maybe like we would just move it down a little, you know, second or third image, that kind of thing in the same, um, they're great photos. So light, it's a wonderful way to do it. You do wanna think about um, like a couple little tiny things, like photographing it on, especially cause it's not moving like on a, the background tends to stay the same, like on parts that either don't have like older dirt or that kind of thing, since it's hard to, to retouch in documentary. Like this, you know, out of, the, out of the frame. But those are like small nitpicky things that aren't super necessary, beautiful someone's um, journal. I do, it would also be great to add like the personal portion of this, like to just say 
the name of the person whose port whose um, journal this is, how old they are, where they're from, just to add a little like humanizing to each of the items. And this image, which makes sense um, when I read about it, um, is this rainbow scarf and how it reminds the person of good things to come because there's a storm, God gives us a rainbow after. Totally makes sense. But when you're looking at all of these images together, that doesn't fit, right? So like maybe putting that scarf instead of on a, on a white wall that's so evenly lit, like maybe on a circle pile on the ground or, you know, whatever it is, or take it out because it brings you out of the story. Like even this dress, like it has the same color scheme as the rest of the images, sorry about that, um, that kind of thing. And it's the first one. So I feel like, like it doesn't, you don't have to do it. And I'm assuming Cynthia, you're going chronologically, like that's the last story you shot. So, but it's not quite as strong as, as the other stories. So maybe consider the same with this image. Um, great. Even though this has a lot of feeling, it might not be the first image. Okay. Could be the second or third. Like start someplace that makes people care about your subjects, which might be this image. Like it's a little bit quieter or even the second image. The second image is beautiful. Even if you just swap them or maybe move this one down a little bit longer because it, um, the story is about uh, survival for people in Zim. Um, unions and 12,000 active vendors in Harare alone with, um, are mostly women. So legal vending at undesignated sites. So that the first image is them fighting is harder because we don't care. We don't know why we care about them fighting. Whereas, oh wait, who is this woman? I want to lean in. And then you slowly build attention to seeing them every day. Like these two images, I like them both, but maybe not next to each other want to move it like beautiful and around now is when I start to care about them right like there's a sense of isolation this is what they do in recreation fitting and now I want to start to see like this is really hard for them wait the women are having to fight and they're going to protest and right those kinds of things and so like just like the tiniest little bit of movement will help editors lean in a little further because you craft the story for them they go to editorial and like this is also a beautiful story you do want to think about um so this story is victims of um, the power utilities negligence which has left a number of people permanently injured or have lost loved ones due to unsecured or unprotected live power cables what right like immediately i i'm angry i want to know what this is a great first it's, there's warmth, there's the bandage, there's all this, the smoke, and she's cooking. Great. Next image, great. Wonderful, beautiful. And here though, you might switch some of these around just because they start to look like the same, the same photo. And it says that you're not, like what you're telling people is that you're not um, constantly coming up with new ways to make portraits of of these people, of your subjects. And there, right? Beautiful. So you wanna keep moving in and out, whereas like they all have big, like this image and this image are so similar. You probably don't need them both. And even this one is really similar, but the lighting is a little different. So if you, as well as this one, so like if you either scatter them more within the story, so they're, you know, further down, this is a beautiful portrait, by the way. Okay, so I'm gonna, so thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick editorial because editorially, um, editorial generally means the things that have been published. Um, and so having like saying, right, what she does here, that this is for the Guardian, great. That this is for this paper. So on the fly, I think we're starting to run out of time. So I'm gonna go a little fast, oops. Editorial, great. 
Um, and last thing, you don't, because they have the same, let's say these top four images, she's wearing the same gi. I don't learn any new information in seeing four of the same photos, right? So choose between these, because this is more portrait based. I, I think that that is a, a stronger photo. This photo, I learned nothing except that she's exercising with kids, but like this kid's head is cut off, that kid's head off, she's got these feet. So it's not as strong. So it's, it's kind of unnecessary when you have a stronger image already, which is right next to it. Yeah, like this is a stronger image that lets the viewer know she's working out with these kids in her neighborhood. She's awesome. Like, you know, so just these two is strong is enough to have. And yeah, and the same with this one with the two hand. Like this is a beautiful image. You don't need the same image again here. Because you're telling editors that you don't edit as much as you, you know, even though they're beautiful photographs, which I think is the thing. Like, so this is called honing your skills because we want to talk about like all of the little tiny ways that we are losing out on work. Okay. Even though, you know, you're already at the level where you should be working constantly or people should, I think people should be doing the work constantly. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to swap over. <laughs> Um, I'm going to swap over and do someone else's because I think, yeah, because we're running out of time. Um, Cynthia, thank you so much for thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, totally. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Um, yeah, I'm going to bring um, Shelby in. Um, uh, but yeah, let's try to do this one fast. Um, Okay, I think Shelby is in as a, there we go. Great. Hi, Shelby. Yep. Oh, there Hi. You Hi. Hi, thanks so much for, for coming on up. Um, okay, so beautiful thing, beautiful portraits, beautifully lit. It's nice that I come in into the thumbnails. Some of them are like especially gorgeous. Um, let's start there. Yeah, let's start there. It's a nice clean site. I know your name. There's a gallery that's a drop down. Let's see if I just go there, right? Yep. The gallery comes right up. Love it. Fabulous. There's contact, there's archive, there's terms. I can get to her um, Instagram and her LinkedIn. Is that LinkedIn? Yeah, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Um, let's go to your contact first. Great. There's a picture of her there, fabulous, who she is, um, where she lives. Great, because they need to know what part of the world you live in, right? So she tells them that an interest last year. I might take out that you found your way back to it last year, just because they don't need to know. That like, oh, wait, you, you disappeared for a long time. You stopped doing it, so you might be a little rusty. Like, I'm, I might take that out. Um, creative outlet, great. Traveling through the continent, working on body of work, beautiful. And she she works and travels. There's her contact information. I would also add your phone number just so that if it's a breaking news story or something that like they need photographed tomorrow and you don't happen to check your email that day, sometimes editors get a little freaked out that they can't just call you or text you or whatever mm -hmm. really quick. So you might throw that up. Even if it's, if you want, you can just, if like, and understandably, sometimes people don't feel good about having their like real phone number on the internet because that's kind of scary. Um, you can do like a Google phone number that sends to your real phone number so people don't have your real number, you know, but it'll still come up on your phone, that kind of thing, which is totally fair. It's like a woman nowadays. Um, so portraits. I love the work. It absolutely is special. Um, I'm gonna do it this way. And we'll just power through real quick. Like this image, like I love the image, but I don't know if I need to see that. Like it takes away a little bit. He's beautiful, great. And so one thing I noticed was that a lot of the work down at the bottom is much better than the work at the top, lighting wise and feeling wise. Um, so editing, I think like that 
that's a great image like his the way his shape of his body the light that's falling in him thing that's coming across also that woman that woman um and so let me go back to the thumbnails and here's another thing though like when shelby submitted her work she also oh i didn't share that she also submitted this um this pdf and the pdf mm -hmm. is incredible the way oh, i can't let me see if i can share that with you guys Option. Right forward desktop preview portfolio. Okay. Um, this is the PDF, right? The PDF lands on this great image. It's not on your website. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually in the archives, yeah. Oh, okay. But like no editors aren't gonna dig through your archive to find, they're just gonna look at portraits and be done, right? So yeah. like, let's move them over. And this is a better portrait of this gentleman. This, these images here, I love seeing all three because now it's not just the standalone image. You've cropped out a little bit of the top. I see the movement that's happening. I see more movement. I see her posing. Like you can have that, that triptych you can have that as the as one image like on your page right like they, it doesn't have to just be one um right. and there is a woman who i thought uh haruka sakaguchi and we'll drop her um her website link in the in the chat and she actually does like on her landing pages of portraits like it'll be one image two images and then a third one overlay comes up and so there's a way to do that i mean i'm not that tech savvy but yeah um I would take out both of these images personally because the clothes date them, even though the model is really interesting, but the clothes tend to, like they don't really work so well together. This image of this, I'm gonna actually go back to your website, sorry. Can you guys see the website again? No, no. sorry. No, okay. PDF. Okay, I'm gonna switch out of the PDF and go back to and that guy. Um, so just, I think like a little bit of editing of what is already there. Cause the work is beautiful. Like that's mm -hmm. a great image. Like this image doesn't really, you know, it's not as great. This image same, like the light here isn't beautiful. She's lost all the detail in her shirt here, but then the image next to it is so great that you're not saying I'm incredible. Like you have such a limited amount of time to tell people how great you are. So use it well. Okay. Um, and you don't want to use the same model more than once unless it's, they're both on the same page. So like this woman's wearing the same shirt as she's wearing here, same hair, right? And so this one is a better portrait of her than this one. So like lose it or, or make it a diptych. If she's, I think there's some more where she's just wearing the white and not the green right. at the same time. So they know that you, in um, let's say Rolling Stone or wherever, when they do portraits of someone, if they ask for three portraits, let's say you're in the studio, you're consistently changing your outfit. And so mm -hmm. this, like you let them know that like, oh, I know that. <laughs> this is what I would do with each of the different, you know, even if it's just an undershirt, it doesn't matter. Um, let's go to that, which is great, but I don't know what ALWF is. Yeah, and I'm still trying when to I figure get out some images. How how to explain to, it like write that in yeah so i'm yeah. actually at Africa, and it's in my bio but i i know that it's kind of hard so people to like kind of piece those two together and so i'm yeah. trying to figure out to relay out but it's basically my project that i'm working on as i travel through africa right now okay so maybe either you can just change it you can change the title to stories you can drop you can leave the title the same but put a text and you don't have to put the text as the first image that you can put text as like second or third image so mm -hmm. that immediately people start to know, okay, this is what I'm looking at. Okay, yeah. Or, you know, or put in caption information that works too. Because otherwise it feels like a disparate group of great images, but like that aren't necessarily connected and your viewer right. won't be able to connect them. Right. Okay. Like that's beautiful, right? That one maybe can come out. And it's a good landing and it looks like you're in the middle east like you go from africa from like um to middle east back to 
to thumbnails, but I like that it's thumbnails. Like maybe that image doesn't like move the narrative along kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your portraits are beautiful. So we just stay there and street stuff. And the street stuff is great, definitely. Think about like your layout so that you're you're moving people through. Like she maybe can come out, but that's stunning. I'm not stunning. And this guy should be in portraits, right? Like, what? He's amazing. <laughs> I love him. And it's a really strong portrait. So why bury it? Um, archive. And this is where you'll start to like, and so I dug into it like, that's a great image that could have been shot for any publication. And I, you know, whereas this feels more like a sweet headshot and this one feels like a sweet headshot. So like stick all of the, or stick, you know, the best one from each, from each of the archives, which for me is this one, um, mm -hmm. into, into your portrait work. Into the gallery. And same here. Yeah, that's where I saw the other, like she's in the white. This is the best one, personally. Okay, awesome. Right. Yeah, like this is awesome this red one, whereas here, partly because it's black and white and you could put these two together, it would be good if you cropped a little bit just so that um, their head sizes aren't the exact same if it becomes a, dicti a diptych, if they're, you know, if it's two images next to each other on the landing or on the page. Um, so like if you cut out some of her, I'm okay, I'm gonna go a little quicker, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry about the time, okay. Um, if you crop out just a little bit of this sweater, then her head, then, you know, the whole image will be a little bit smaller so that it, it moves quickly through, you know, so nicely. So it'll be a nice layout. Um, but the light on her here, if you bring that down a little, it's like a little too bright. So it looks like you lost detail, which tells them that technically you're not quite there, which isn't the case. Cause like, here you are, right? Like it's the same light and it's perfect on her. Okay. Um, I'm getting notes to go a little faster. <laughs> uh, wrap it up. Okay. So yeah, beautiful work. Thank you so much for <laughs> coming and being out. <laughs> yeah, awesome. We shall see. Um, okay. I'm going to and just really quick talk about um, someone's Instagram. Can you see my my uncle's work? Yeah. Up yet? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and this is just like a quick five minute. Um, so he didn't have a website to show us, um, but he constantly works for Turner, which is an Italian um, like wires agency. So I just got to see the Instagram, but it's, I learned something really quickly about him. I know where he's based. He's in New Delhi. Great. He's available for assignments. This is where he contributes. But I also know one that he knows to take a nice portrait that he is one on the ground, which is great during COVID, right? Since people aren't traveling. I know that he knows how to do these really nice wide shots of things and he's going back day after day to the same sites. And also that he really likes to see, um, oh, what's the word for that? Like duplicates in his brain. Like he likes um, organization of many of the same things in a photo, which is actually really inform interesting information, right? Um, He's with, he can be with women, he can be with men. There's no place that he's not, that he's scared, he's not scared to go. Um, he's in protests, but also he can do intimacy and, or solace, solitude, solitude. He can shoot at night. He's willing to get up and close person, up close and personal. This is a beautiful image. The light's exactly right. This guy bending. It's hard when you can't see it exactly. Um, this, gentleman, this gentleman bending. Right? Beautiful. Like I know a bunch of things about him just from his Instagram. Yeah, same. Um, yeah. So Instagram can end up being like one of your one of your calling cards and a great marketing tool because a lot of times people are just finding you. A lot of editors are just finding you based on that. I've definitely gotten quite a few jobs based on like, oh, wait, I've been following you for like a year on Instagram, but I actually have the story that might be right for you. And it, that way I am still in people's minds. 
Um, yeah, I think that's the end of my talk. You guys have any questions? Great. Um, let's see, are we all back? There we go. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for that. And thank you to the, the three um, photographers who let us, uh, you know, let Nikki look through her work. Um, so we've got uh, a few minutes left and a bunch of great questions have come in. So let's uh, try to do as many as possible. Um, and I'll just grab one to start us off. Um, a couple people have asked about um, uh, retouching. Um, can you elaborate on what can be retouched or not? Um, and uh, can you expand on when you said that there's no retouching in documentary photography in general and in the international contests? I think we've got a couple people who are newer to the documentary world. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's, you know, that's kind of new information for them. So. Yeah, absolutely. So in the commercial world, everything can be retouched, like skin, if there's a harsh shadow across someone's face with a, you know, a black line on the nose, like we saw that you can retouch that in Photoshop so that that's, you know, it blends like the shadow to the, oh, you can't see me. I'm like, wait, you can't see, you can see me. Uh, from the shadow detail to the, to the highlight. Um, whereas in documentary work, you know, and the idea for documentary, of course, in journalism, is that it's true to what is there in front of you, right? So in portraits, in documentary, you can, you can turn people, you can pose them, you can do that. And then you have to write in your caption, posed portrait so that it is still a very clear line that you move them. Whereas if you're photographing a bombing, anything else, like anything that's a documentary story, you can't move people. You, um, you just need to wait for them to walk into the light. And at that point, like after you have the images, if it's too, you, there's only a few things that you're allowed to do in terms of um, editing the photo, which is you can, you know, bring your highlights down, you can bring your shadows up, but you can't use the clone tool, you can't use the brush tool, anything that takes out information or adds information is a huge no-no. And World Press Photo, actually, you will be disqualified. Like if you get into the final round, they then go through your image with a fine tooth comb and look to see if there is any retouching, even if it was like that person had a pimple on their neck and I took it out, you're now disqualified from being in that contest. And so you just wanna um, be aware of those kinds of things. Great, thanks. Um, um, how about, someone asked about pacing. I think this came in when you were showing Danielle's work. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I think it's so hard because photo editing is such a subjective thing. And, you know, storytelling is such a subjective thing. But yeah, how do you think about pacing for a, for a story or for images on a website? Mm -hmm. um, I, I took some classes, both with um, a photographer called Beck, Nicole Sobecki, who worked incredible. And also with Black Women Photographers spoke to um, one of the photo editors at NPR and he was talking to me and I think both of them really helped me understand it in, in a different way. Um, Keith was saying at NPR that he, you, his old editor used to put, like when the, this was a day when there was prints, they would print out the entire story, all the images that were really nice. And then he would take a coin, the editor would take a coin out and put it over people's faces. And if everyone's head was the same size in each image, that was a problem, right? Because you need to, you need to have close-ups, you need to have further shots, you need to have wide shots, all of the things that create the sense of place and understanding um, in that image. And I think that that's, part, that's pacing essentially, right? And it's hard to do when you're shooting, but just get in people's faces, move far back, all of those things so that when you put the story together in your 10 images or whatever, you're, you're going forward and back. Yeah. That's what did there. Great. Yeah. And one thing that always helped me in thinking about this, especially because you talked a little bit about like repeti repetitive images, especially when it's a photo story. If you sat down to read a text story or a book and you read the same sentence over and over again, you'd put that book away. You'd be like, I don't yeah. need that. So think about, you know, editing your photos the same way. Um, and uh, yeah, let's do more questions just really quickly. Um, oh, I see Austin, that's a great idea too. So 
We are thinking about doing more of the essentials classes in the future. There are two more in this in, in the next two weeks. Um, so please register for those, but also keep dropping notes in the chat or email us about things you would want these classes to cover in the future, because we're hoping to do uh, the second semester of the essentials. So let us know what you want to learn. Um, but yeah, what other questions have come in? Yeah, lots of great questions. Um, one from Tunde. How do you get story ideas? For instance, what prompted the As the Water Comes or a malady of spirit stories where you commissioned by a publication or in an organization? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think everyone works really differently. Personally, and this, I don't, I don't advocate this to anyone because it's a really, it's a difficult choice. Um, I go to live in a country and a country that's interesting to me at the moment. I'm in Colombia because I started, um, you know, I just, I read a lot of news and I started seeing like SOS Buenaventura. Um, and I was like, what is Buenaventura? Buenaventura is an 84% um, formerly enslaved Africans who live in, who are Afro-Colombian. Um, whereas the rest of the country is 10% is like, and they're essentially, you know, very, very light. They're more Spanish. Why are, why are they being disenfranchised? Like what's going on? And like slowly as I started to dig into that story, I was like, cool, I'm gonna go live in Colombia. Like, I wanna know, I wanna understand what's going on there and like how their plight is different than African-Americans in, in, in the US and like, and understand those things. And I think that often stories are very complicated and I can't just figure it out from reading. Like I have to go live there and I have to talk to people. And, and so that's generally how my stories happen, um, which I totally understand. That's not really a thing that a lot of people can do. Like I'm so privileged that, that it's been a possibility. Um, so yeah, so for the, Healthcare story, I was living in, in Zanzibar in Tanzania and so often I would find, you know, like half the population, if not more, was going to traditional healer, but there's hospitals and doctor and clinics everywhere within like a few kilometers of people's homes. And so I didn't understand, and it's socialized, socialist. So it's really inexpensive, like a dollar fifty or something. And that's how much it costs to get on a bus across town. So what, what was the impetus that made people really stay with traditional healers? And what I kept finding as, you know, and so all the foreigners had one idea and I was like, I, I don't know if that's really the right. And as I started digging into it and talking to people and um, interviewing traditional healers, the answer was actually that the, that the hospitals, like people die there a lot, like really frequently. Um, and so no one trusts them. They'd rather go to, you know, a woman who helped their grandmother, who helped their auntie, who, you know, their neighbor, like those kinds of things, right? And so like, yeah, like whatever interests me is the story. And then I pitched the story later um, to a publication because sometimes they don't believe in the story <laughs> like I do. So I either pitch the publication after or like in the middle after I've done, you know, a little bit of investigating um, to really see if it's a great story. Sometimes still nobody likes it. And then I pitch um, like the beautiful everyday projects uh, grant that's coming up. Like that's enough money to, to live in a place for like six to eight months and really work on the project. Um, yeah, so I highly encourage grant work. Yeah. Great, great answer. Related, how do you keep the stories you are um, working on, you know, consistent um, and stay on top of them? Like, do you ever like do a follow up, or if the timing doesn't work out, you know, specifically right now for a grant, would you then you know go back to them and you know refresh it in a in a way? Uh, I don't know if I understand the question. Like, do I start a story and then I don't get any funding? So then I like wait a while and then come back to it? Is that even that's the question? Um, that's how I see it. Um, but the question okay. is, how do you keep the stories you photograph consistent and stay on top of them? Consistent, um, consistent I think is something that just over time, I've, I've been in documentary just for like two or three, three and a half, maybe four years, I don't know. Um, but I, one, I enter contests, but also things like women photograph and black women photograph, like photographers, there are mentors. And so we're constantly on, and I'm one, I'm in one now with Kayana Hayeri out of Afghanistan and Saraline, who's the normal or the former Nat Geo national photo director. And so I talk to them like once a week or every two weeks and they look at what I'm doing and they're like, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> like, why are you not? going this direction you're missing the, you know so I can see the holes in my story because mm -hmm. journalism unlike commercial like you need you need a team you need a community who 
is going to help you get better. Mm-hmm. And so that's how they, the images they can put them. I think that answer. And with COVID, if you got money for something, I won a grant last year that I couldn't go and photograph because I couldn't get into that country. And they're like, it's fine. Like they'll wait for you for a year to come back down. Thank you. Um, I do notice the time. Are you okay on time to answer a few more questions, Nikki? Yeah, totally. I'm, okay, awesome. I'm off the rest of the day. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so there's one question. Um, how can we build our portfolio? We don't have much published work yet. I would suggest uh, to go back to Andrea Weiss's class that we had a week ago where she stressed the importance of you know personal work. Um, that is the great way, an easy way to build your portfolio um, when you don't have that those publication credits coming in yet. Um, and then there are a few lighting cl- uh, questions. So I'm gonna just turn to those right now. Um, Lucy asks, how would you shoot differently in harsh overhead sun if you had to now? Uh, now I bring in either a diffuser or I ask them to move, which was that little video thing, right? Like, oh, can we, if it's a portrait, you can just turn them a little bit. Or it, there's usually, especially because of the countries that I work in now, like there's always an extra person around, like my fixer or my translator, like, hey, could you hold this for me? <laughs> like, so I just bring a bounce and like, that dude is holding it to bring in light in the eyes, right? Like there's, which would be harder to do in New York City. Like I couldn't just find a random person in New York and be like, hey, could you (laughs) hold this, you know? Which is why like you have to have an assistant. So yeah, basically for harsh overhead light, you want a diffuser overhead to cut the light and a diffuser is something between whatever that direct light source is and it scatters the light. So it becomes softer. Um, So then the shadows disappear. That's a great answer related so but if you don't have any assistance is there a way to put a reflector on a stand or do you yeah, have the definitely. person in the photograph hold the reflector both um you can definitely put it on a stand there's um you can buy something it's like i don't know where you're based but in the u.s like you can have it shipped to most countries from bnh or adorama or wherever um and it basically sits on your light stand it's a long thing that's that can be extended or you know retracted and it has these little clips on the end And so it'll hold the reflector. So you put the stand down, you put this little piece on top and then it holds the reflector where you want it. Definitely that. Um, And And sometimes you can get a, you can have the model hold it too. (laughs) I love your demonstration. Yeah, Yeah, thanks. (laughs) I love it. Amazing. Um, We're gonna take these last two questions. Um, um, Going to the portfolio aspect on your website. Is there an ideal uh, maximum or minimum number of photos to include per project? Might it change yes. depending on um, the topic slash ooh. focus type of photography? Hold on a sec. Oh, sorry. It's gonna turn off. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you are. Okay, sorry, my. No worries. Um, Um, I'll repeat the question one more time. Yes, please. Uh, Is there an ideal maximum or minimum number of photos to include per project? Might it change depending on the topic or focus type of photography? Definitely a minimum, I mean, a maximum, like you don't want to do more than 20 and 20 is so many. (laughs) You just need, you, if you have, I photograph someone in their home with their child for like, four weeks or something and I was like oh my god it's all the same photo of like the kid crying her getting out of bed feeding the kid putting the kid to bed right and so like do I need to show three pictures of that kid eating dinner no it's unnecessary even if they're all really great photos I choose which one is the one good photo of the child eating dinner or the kid crying that kind of thing to just get the message across like people don't need to be inundated and so and this is the hard part is um understanding which photos you need. And that's where the community comes in because you need your friends. I won a grant last year, I think. And I asked like six friends, I made videos of my pitch, of my like storyline, <laughs> like, and they definitely moved them around. They were like, that second photo is your best picture. It should be the first photo, right? To grab people who are looking at the images or whatever. And I would have never made that assessment myself. And so send it to people. Yes, I can't stress that enough. And that's why portfolio reviews are so important. Um, my goodness, I can't stress it enough. Um, let me see, going to relate again to portfolios, what were the ways that you learned uh, to caption and bring people into the story? 
Mm. Captions were difficult and I'm still not the best at them, but I've been listening. So who, what, when, and where needs to be in your caption, the date, the metadata, um, and you can copy and paste those things in um, photo mechanics. So it helps a little bit. Um, I believe that Everyday Projects and Black Women Photographers is actually going to have an editor, maybe, to talk about? Like to teach, help people yeah, understand. Yeah. We're going to talk about captions. Yeah. Uh, it's in season will. two. That's in part we two. We will, we will, because, <laughs> oh my goodness, there's a yeah. lot of things to include in a caption, and it's so important. Yeah. It can really make the difference between getting hired or not. And the first line should just be exactly what's happening. Women walking across the street on this date in this city straightforward right that's the action and then after that you start adding the context five minutes after a bomb was detonated behind her um the bus blew up a quarter of a block away and she just walked away like all of that becomes the second and third and fourth and fifth line and then you might into your second paragraph which you don't have to have at first um the rest of the detail Awesome. And there's one last question that's unrelated to this. How do you find a fixer, a local or a local person in an unfamiliar uh, location? I personally also like it's I, it's not the best way to do it um, <laughs> because I'm living there. Like I just start hanging out and talking to people like I sit outside near the beach, like eventually like I meet someone yesterday I met someone who was someone else's tour guide. And he was just so nice and like smart and was really interested in like sharing the cultural and political aspects of a country that, you know, is in turmoil. Um, that I was like, oh, buddy, what are you doing next month, <laughs> next week? Like, let's, you know, you should be my fixer, even though he's not, and you know, that's not his job, but it's fine. Like he can, he can translate. He understands everything. People know him. He's filled with joy. Like you want to do that. You want someone who's not like angry and surly, like that's not going to help really get into places. Um, but usually if you're going to a country that you're not familiar with, the magazine can help or newspaper helps you connect you to a fixer. Amazing. Thank you, Nikki. We cannot thank you enough for all your expertise this morning um, or afternoon or evening, wherever you are at, sorry. <laughs> um, and to the those who shared their portfolios uh, with the cult class, thank you for being vulnerable as we shared, um, because it's not easy to have a critique and then have a critique in a room full of over 100 people. So thank you all for sharing your portfolios. Um, thank you all for dropping your feedback in the chat. We love it. Please also share your feedback in the survey that you'll receive, because that's important for us to note. Um, and as we move forward with future classes, um, I do want to say, because we have mentioned portfolios, 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 and reviews, um, if you are a Black woman or a non-binary photographer and you, are, and you are interested in a portfolio review, please do reach out. Uh, this morning, I connected uh, quite a few photographers with New York Times and Nat Geo um, photo editors for a free portfolio review session. Uh, something that I really uh, stress and I really try my best to provide those for free, make those connections for free for photographers who are in need of a portfolio review. So I just wanted to share that. Um, Peter, any housekeeping notes from you or Nikki, any last words from you? Thank you so much for consistently showing up for the community and like helping us make our way in this really um, difficult field. Yeah, well, thank you, Nikki. We really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for being so engaged. And uh, next week's class is not on Wednesday. It is on Thursday. That's my only other housekeeping note. But um, thank you for that looking, reminder. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to seeing everyone then. See you next Thursday at 12 Eastern. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care.